The term anti-pattern sees a lot of usage in the tech space, especially in a development context. While the term isn't exclusive to this area, it was created here, and that's because the usage of patterns is a very common construct in a development context. To understand what an anti-pattern is, we first need to understand what a pattern actually is. We all understand what a graphical pattern is, a repeated sequence of graphical elements. So a programming pattern would be a repeated sequence of programming elements or programming constructs. A term you may have heard before is design pattern. This is basically at the infrastructure level of a programming project. This is a repeated sequence of design steps or design elements. One example being a singleton. So an anti-pattern then would be a repeated sequence of negative actions or negative constructs. Even in the case of a pattern that isn't explicitly negative, just because it's common practice doesn't mean that it's always a good idea to blindly follow it. That actually is one of the anti-patterns. So we understand what an anti-pattern is at a conceptual level, but what does it actually look like at the implementation level? One common example of an anti-pattern is vendor lock-in. This is basically where you start using some sort of component, let's say it's a library or some hardware technology, and by using that component, you're basically locking yourself into actually using it and trying to replace it is incredibly difficult. Let's say you buy an iPhone. When you buy this iPhone, this isn't going to work properly with things outside of the Apple ecosystem. But if you want a development example, let's say you start using a database that uses some proprietary extensions to SQL that getting rid of those makes it really difficult to actually replicate those statements. Another example is over-engineering. This is basically where you spend extra time and extra money making the project more complex and more robust when there's not really any productive reason to actually be doing so. Let's say you have some user input. You validate that user input, and once it's in the system, it's been validated. But then every single time you pass that input to another function, you validate it again. This would be a form of over-engineering. Or let's say you make use of a database when really a simple text file would have sufficed. Or how about the example of cargo cult programming where you take patterns, libraries, excerpts of code, and just stick them into your project without understanding how they actually work or why you're actually doing so. And you see this very commonly with new developers. I'm speaking from personal experience here where they'll go to somewhere like Stack Overflow, search for some question that matches what they're trying to do, copy the answer, and then not really bother working out what the answer's actually doing. It just produces the right result, so it's going to be fine. And that is fine until it doesn't produce the right result, and now you have to work out how to actually modify it. I've got two examples left, and the first one is hard coding. So this is basically where you take runtime assumptions, and then you stick them into the code base rather than actually querying for them. Let's say your project needs a Python installation, but it doesn't really matter what version of Python it is, as long as it's something that's at least Python 3, for example. And you say, this project needs Python 3.9 because that's the version you're running on your system. If someone isn't actually running that version, even though the code base should run perfectly fine without it, it won't actually work. And the last one I'm mentioning that we all know about and we've all been at fault for, spaghetti code. This is code that is so complex and so poorly laid out that if you were to trace the lines that are actually running inside of the code base, it would start to look like a bowl of spaghetti. A good metric for whether you have spaghetti code is if you look at the code base and feel like if you take a week off, you'll forget everything that's happening in the code base and need to relearn the entire flow structure, you might have spaghetti code and you might need to do a refactor. This is by no means an exhaustive list of anti-patterns, it's just some of the less controversial ones that everyone can agree on basically being bad. Because not everything that's called an anti-pattern is inherently bad. Many of the anti-patterns out there are highly controversial and actually have a lot of perfectly reasonable use cases. Let's take a god object for example. So in an object-oriented code base, this would be an object that basically has its fingers in everything. It does way too much. It's not a simple class that does HTTP requests or does mathematics. It does a bit of everything. This is usually coupled with the design pattern known as a singleton, where rather than being able to instantiate as many instances of that object as you want, a singleton can only have one instance. 
in a lot of projects that would be horrible, but in game design, it's very common to have a data master where rather than having each of the individual classes having their own data, they all just store it in this one main object. The reason why you do this is because going to this main object is quicker than having to go and run six or seven function calls just to get one variable. But it's not just in game design. Where performance is of utmost importance, this is a very common thing to happen. Now, many anti-patterns also depend on the development context as well as the context of the users of the project. So let's say something like telemetry. If you're a Linux user or just someone who just generally cares more about privacy, you probably will say that telemetry is an anti-pattern. But what if you're a developer for Google or Amazon or Twitter? You might not agree. You might think telemetry actually is a good thing. While I'm 100% on the side of the privacy focused, the point I'm making here is that anti-patterns aren't a metric for quality. If your project has an anti-pattern, that might actually be a good thing, and you might just not think that what someone else thinks is an anti-pattern even is one altogether. So complaining about anti-patterns is not helpful, and if you think it actually is a problem, you need to explain why that anti-pattern actually is a problem. And the exact same applies to things that are generally considered very positive patterns, things like client server or peer-to-peer -peer or model view controller. If they're used poorly, they absolutely become anti-patterns in those contexts. Ultimately, what it comes down to is are you approaching the project in the best way possible? If that includes using God objects and singletons, maybe even some vendor lock-in, if that is the best thing for the project, then it's fine. If it's not, then maybe you should consider actually changing. Another term you may hear is code smell. This is a characteristic of source code which indicates a potential issue. It's called a code smell because it's like a part of the code base has gone rotten and you can smell something wrong with it. Now, the guys who originated these two terms may not agree on this, but in practice, they are the exact same thing. Anti-patterns and code smells really do don't differ. The only meaningful difference is usually code smell is at the source code level and anti-patterns are usually at the architecture and management level, but anti-patterns absolutely can be at the source code level as well. And many authors actually do use them interchangeably. Usually if a lecturer at university or college asks you about the difference between code smells and anti-patterns, they will want that source code distinction. I know this because I've gotten into long-winded arguments with lecturers lecturers about how they are the exact same thing and you can find plenty of sources online that treat them as such. It's just that in the literature that originated the terms, they were different. Is this just me putting my four-year degree I'm sitting on to use? I guess so. That's going to be pretty much everything for me. Let me know your thoughts on all of this in the comment section down below. That'll be everything for me, and before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Logan, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Carl, Mitchell, Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Josh, Peter D, Stephen, Tease, Theroux, Tony Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go on support work, the link's down below to my Patreon, subscribe, start, limp, pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week as well as upload YouTube shorts and this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That'll be everything for me and I'm out.